Oh, right. I had one of those almost forgetting to hit the record a few days ago, right after talking about not forgetting to hit the record. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what I was doing though. Oh, pray! That was what. It, have you seen Prey? Uh, the new Predator, uh, Native American movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, except for the CGI bear, I liked it pretty well. <laughs> I don't know if you caught the CGI bear because a you know bear starts doing things you would not be able to get a real bear to do on screen. It looks like a PlayStation <laughs> 2 movie just for about 30 seconds. So didn't like that, but otherwise, yeah, sure. <laughs> they couldn't afford the bear's agent in the insurance package, I'm sure. I think it's a, yeah, I mean, I, I just like that level of film. I, I guess that's the plus of like streaming films, something like that, or Color Out of Space, where it's, uh, you actually start getting these like kind of mid-budget films again, because we had been lacking them in the whole Star Wars Marvel glut, I think. <laughs> I, I actually really liked Prey. It was um, like I don't have the same nostalgia for the Predator series because I didn't get to watch that one as I was growing up. So I watched all the Predator movies like I, I would say like beyond their prime to where I'd heard all the quotes and I'd seen all the imagery and the toys and everything before I had seen the movies. So Prey was kind of cool, and I but I didn't have the same attachment. Color Out of Space is like in my top 20 movies probably. Um, yeah, it's, definitely I my favorite from the movie. past few years. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, just, you know, like until about 2017, we just like there was a 10 year period where we, we just didn't get those nice mid budget movies that, you know, try and do things a little more wild or something. So. But yeah, I got my yeah, I had the thing where I forgot to plug in my computer and then it just it, there's no warning. It just shuts off and it took like 30 minutes to get it back on. But <laughs> we're we're here. We're going. We're good. OK. <laughs> So, so I guess... and, and I did my I did my homework for this one too. So <clears throat> even the, even though the title might seem like it might not be one of the more interesting ones, there's definitely more than enough fodder here. And hopefully, it's not just rehash stuff because I because I'm been going into this one in particular totally blind and finding just interesting connections and backstories and stuff. Okay, I, I basically got myself um kept up on all the production stuff. So. Um, I I feel like that's sort of my job. <laughs> that's actually great. That'll be a great counter because I because I own the only production stuff that I realized were voices that I recognized and some of the animations that I recognized being reused. So I looked some of that stuff up and I've got some names, but I'd love to hear your backstory on like the extra detail like you always bring. Also in the middle of reading, and I, I'm I'm like, man, I've been reading this for a while. It's like 15 percent of the book. So uh, the, the I'm reading the Disney War, which I guess if you have a paper version of it, you could probably murder somebody with it. it must be like super thick. So <laughs> the name of the book is called the Disney War. Yeah, it starts in the 80s with I. It's basically documenting Eisner's uh, time uh, as the head of Disney. I guess so. It's you know beginning of Eisner up until he steps down. I've got what well, so what year exactly did he step down? Um oh I something like 2006 for good. I mean he was already kind of a lame duck for a few years before that. Okay. But uh and he started about 82 83 I think. So yeah. <laughs> I got a, f a funny I mean it's <clears throat> it was just a quick anecdote but when I was working on the back lot of Hollywood um MGM um studios in Orlando I worked on a little animation building for a, some part of time and then we moved off the lot but while i was on the lot when i first started there and got transitioned into full time um i went from contractor to like you know backstage basically employee and i got a little green card it was literally like a green pass that had my picture on it and everything but in order to get that i had to go through the same training that anyone would go through if you were going to have any kind of role in the company from you know janitor to a, a character in the park to like a, a white sort of collar guy <clears throat> and part of that training was you know you had to just like do a bunch of trivia and you had to go through like a couple weeks of sort of like onboarding and at the very conclusion of this i got through all of it and when it went to go and take the picture they said that i had to shave <clears throat> and it was and i actually was like no i wasn't in you know any of the mm -hmm. uh the agreements or anything because i <clears throat> i didn't actually have to go out into the park or show my face or anything i just worked in this animation building the entire time 
So anyways, I, I push back as long as I possibly could, like months go on because I'm still getting paid and I still can go in and out of the park and everything. I just haven't signed some paper somewhere that like made it official in, you know, paperwork land. And uh, after, I guess, like three or four weeks of just kind of pushing it back and not doing not, you know, not shaving and following up and getting the picture taken, my boss pulls me in and he was like, why did I just get an email that had a, a letterhead from the the office of Michael Eisner saying, you know, who's this idiot peon that's like refusing to shave their fucking beard for a job? Sorry, excuse my Disney, um, <laughs> but anyway, but I mean that was uh, that was just my my quick little anecdote. But I I actually got somebody yelled at through. It probably wasn't Eisner himself, but it was definitely someone that was sending emails that, you know, had the footer in it. So man, if it was five years earlier, you could have gotten like the paper version to like frame on your wall or something. Well, the reason I asked, because I, I started there, I think in 2004 at the very earliest and I might've gotten full time around 05, 06. And that was right around when he was leaving. So I, I really doubt that, you know, the beard of some new employee had any kind of, uh, you know, blip on his radar, but I felt I felt special enough. I almost feel like I got yelled at by him personally, even though that's not exactly how it played out. <laughs> um, gee, I guess I'll just leave that in as as we're getting as we're talking Disney, talking smack about Disney in that case. But uh, it is the Occult Disney podcast. This is Matt here. Thomas is there. He's the paranoid American. Feeling paranoid today? Uh, yeah. I mean, a little bit more so than ever. All right. <laughs> Uh, today we kind of went for a twofer. Um, it sounds like you have something to talk about and I, I can at least spew some random trivia on, well, we combined two movies. We took Lady and the Tramp, Fox and the Hound, giving us four animals to think about today. Most of them in the, uh, canine family, but that, that's fine. <laughs> and I went above and beyond and also watched the live action CGI remake of Lady and the Tramp j just, just to be an overachiever. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't take that step. I did have with my Have Fox you ever one. seen it? No. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure I've actually seen Lady and the Tramp before uh, prepping for this one. It's just, you know, that's one that I guess Disney animal movies aren't the ones that appeal to me. We Re to remind me your, your age again? Uh, 43. So I would have been okay. two but years yeah, old. You're not, you're not so off. I mean, these were all made way before you were old enough to understand half of them, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure two year old Matt was dragged off to see Fox and the Hound, you know, throw him in the theater. And yeah, because that was 81, I think. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure I saw it in the theater. Uh, Lady and the Tramp, though, yeah, it's just, I mean, that doesn't appeal to a boy, right? So last one we do is Peter Pan. Love Peter Pan. Next one, Sleeping Beauty, has some issues, but one of the most beautiful animations ever. So, you know, uh, this just kind of falls into my personal memory hole, I guess. <laughs> So where do you want to kick this off? Because there's there's plenty of ground to cover, I think, especially since we're doing double duty here. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just uh, let's just go straight for Lady. Which now, before getting into it, I was just like, 1955 is the release, and I'm like, Disney himself was very likely very little involved with this movie because this is Disneyland being constructed where he's like on site at Disneyland starting to wear goofy thirties, you know, zoot suit sort of fashions again. That that's where his focus was. So, um, but lady and tramp weirdly it's um, the seed for the movie comes before the story it's based on, which is weird. It was a 1938, 1939 proposal where it was just going to be lady. There was no tramp. And then there's a, um, a book that came out, uh, not a book, a story in Cosmopolitan Magazine in uh, 1945, which uh, I didn't memorize the title of it, but some like something. Happy Dan, dog. I think. That's it, Happy Dan. And um, they were like, wait a minute, wait, why don't we have a character like Happy Dan and put that with your lady character? And um, by the time the movie got made, uh, uh, I think the guy's name was Grant. He had left the studio. He does not get credit on this movie, even though he did about... 10 years of the groundwork but you know just like sketches ideas once they got he, he was never involved with the nitty gritty of the production or anything so yeah like what's the name of the guy that designed the nike logo yeah okay are you gonna tell me or is that like a no i'm question? just saying like who knows <laughs> <laughs> okay I, I thought you're gonna like maybe blow my mind there but uh <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, but... it was just some, I mean, it was like some guy that got paid like 300 bucks or something i mean I, you know he has a name you can look it up but it's the, the the point being that the people that usually make that concept work and the, and the sketch work, um, I mean, even though that 
plays an incredibly vital role in the final outcome. Very rarely do they get their name up in the credits. And we're going to see that again with Fox and the Hound. So, <laughs> so these are both movies. Well, Fox and the Hound, like, basically didn't put on the names of like multiple animators that did work on it but we'll we'll get to that a little later um as far as this one i i didn't even what did you realize what year lady and the tramp is set in 1909 i had okay. to look it up because you had to there look was, it up. well like I, I saw a horse and carriage and i saw like there was no electricity really um aside from very minor stuff maybe um like and like just the technology that was in use like the way that they were hanging up clothes had all the houses had these little devices attached to the sides so i did have to look this up and it was an interesting note that the people that were watching this movie like um you know in the 80s or something or you know in sorry the in people that were watching 80s. this in the 80s they're thinking back to the 1950s as the golden years but the people that actually watched this as it came out their golden years were essentially like 1909 that was but you know back before the world got crazy and all this technology started taking over that was like their golden years and that's why this um movie kind of takes place during that and uh yeah i i didn't note that till after i saw the movie also that I mean, I'm even like wondering why didn't this end up being the case in the end? It was actually supposed to be a Disney's hometown, like a animated recreation of it. Uh, again, he's working on Main Street on Disneyland at you know this exact point in time, so I guess he's he's feeling very nostalgic for those uh, before everything went crazy years himself. You know, it's still. I mean, it had that hometown Main Street look for sure, even if it didn't match you know where he grew up specifically. Yeah, it was. He was just um had. I guess they just didn't take the boss's suggestion to actually make it, you know, by name that town. But yeah, it, it basically works that way. It's fine. Um, Which is interesting because there was, you might have, have had this note in here, but that the name Tramp uh, originally, like nobody wanted the name Tramp at all. And the names like Mutt and um, kind of like Scoundrel and a few other names had kind of come up. And Walt, I guess, had his own personal copy of the script. And as he was thumbing through it, he personally scribbled out the name and wrote in Tramp in a bunch of instances. And everyone kind of took that as him, like, putting his foot down. Um, but everyone kind of, at the time, also considered the the word Tramp a little bit problematic and that it could cause issues with marketing. But, you know, he kind of pushed it through. And I thought that was interesting, if, especially if he was, like, hands off with this project because he had other stuff going on it does seem like a classic walt disney move to like not have a whole lot of you know input during some of the process but then go in and be like i want this thing to be called tramp and i don't care who's got a problem with it the name's tramp and then just walking back out and you know doing something else completely unrelated so if this had been made like 20 years later could he have been super tramp that would have been cool <laughs> Or breaking out into you know seventies soft rock or whatever. <laughs> um, actually, you mentioned my notes and my my little. I noticed I lost half of my notes through my computer kerfuffle, but I'm sure I'll make do. But yeah, you know Frank Sinatra said that the lady is a tramp, right? Was it before or after this movie? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I would have to say the song would have to have come before that. I was. I'm pretty sure, which might be why. So, um, uh, another big kind of just production trivia thing is this is the first disney cinemascope movie at least animation um so peter pan was still academy ratio and this is the first time where they had trouble animating the characters like because you can't just focus on one easily on such a wide screen so uh, they were having trouble blocking the characters and trying to think of new creations and um it turns out there actually is two versions of this because a lot of theaters couldn't do cinemascope so they actually animated a lot of it twice one in, in that smaller aspect and one and so i guess when you saw this on video in the uh 80s you weren't necessarily getting a terrible pan and scan so that's nice yeah that is nice it is a weird and, and one honest to... good i was just gonna say it is a weird one to start cinemascoping on because uh sleeping beauty makes full use of it and peter pan like would peter pan have worked like with a nice wide screen uh absolutely i think it would have yeah, I feel like that's where they should have started. Um, Cinderella, I don't know, maybe because there's only four characters seems to make more sense, like like in that smaller, you know, the Academy ratio. But yeah, Peter Pan, I'm like, they kind of, I'm not saying they dropped the ball. It's like, you know, not making your movie 3D is sometimes a really good choice, right? So Cinemascope would be well, the same. Well, when they started Lady and the Tramp, I think that uh, 
it was going to be done a little bit earlier even and Walt and he even Walt believed his own team had kind of lost some of the heart in it and it kind of like sat around for a little bit and he had to get in re-inspired and, and part of that process was taking a bunch of this team and putting them on to Sleeping Beauty I think wasn't it and then after they worked on that for a little while they came back onto this team somewhat like reinvigorated uh, was one of the words that I had and read in one of the the memoirs that they came back to this team and like knocked the rest of this movie back out. Well, yeah, after doing Sleeping Beauty, this would be easy because that benefits from just having epic looks for Lady and the Tramp while very well animated. I mean, they're definitely like, you know, uh, this is the nice second phase, I guess, of classic Disney where uh, after the war, it took them a few movies to really get everything looking sharp again. Uh, we mentioned Cinderella having really flat tones, which I, I don't, I mean, this is lacking some of that storybook quality of the original, but uh, um, oh, uh, it was well, this is have... also Walt getting pulled away to do some of those propaganda films that we went over previously. Right. Uh, because, because we went over like one of the, the OG ones that kind of had some of the mo- more interesting, you know, stuff in it, but he continued to make those for a while. And that was kind of one of the reasons in addition to the park and, you know, he had a, a million different irons in the fire at this point. Oh yeah. I mean, the, uh, he's on TV every week now with the wonderful world of Disney or whatever it was called in the fifties. I, I think that's what it was called. In the 50s. He's, I mean, he's at the tail end of uh, a paperclip here too. He's pushing out uh, Warner Von Braun videos and introducing, you know, ex Nazis into the world. <laughs> The children so he, they had the children's shows right yeah yeah exactly i mean those are fantastic to watch but yeah when Werner comes on he doesn't really have a calming presence or anything <laughs> i don't know when i made the rockets yeah <laughs> there's a great uh tom Lehrer song and the the joke is that um like i'm the one that makes the rockets and i send them up into the air but who cares where they come down you know my name is Werner von brown like that's they pay me to get the rockets up there and who cares <laughs> you know if or where they come down and explode well, there is the thing that, uh, you know, more Germans died in the production of the V2s than were, you know, killed in attacks. <laughs> so the Germans actually took the, the highest casualty rate on those on those rockets. <laughs> Forward progress, right? Now, we, now we've got modern day uh, rocketry. Thank you. Yeah. But um, it, uh, again, this is just like a weird one where they're kind of starting to put this epic treatment on, but it's a very not epic film. I mean, not, you know, I'm not saying that's a, a bad thing, but just it's a small story, you know? Yeah, I, I got to say my main note on this, because I, I always keep an eye out for the animation and you know, the different planes and, you know, how much detail are in the different sort of, um, you know, planes for the foreground and the background and how many frames are in between. And also for the last couple, I've been uh, alternating between regular 1x speed and going up to like 2x just to see how much smoother the animation becomes if it looks choppy in certain places just to just to see like the the fluidity of it and this one stuck out as being kind of like what you said they got like their footing back again the the quality was to the point where it's like it doesn't stand out in in good ways and bad ways like nothing necessarily knocks your socks off but there's also no obvious like blurred frames and no uh like weird kind of like um you know missing or awkward inks that we, I do think come up in like the Fox and the Hound um, come up a little bit more often than in this one, for example. So like it, they were giving it their all, but the movie itself was like a weird candidate. And, and I think Fox and the Hound, we'll, we'll get to it, has some distinct reasons for that. Um, one thing that it, it, this is, you know, Captain Hindsight should have been, would have been um, apparently, and this, but this might have actually helped this movie get just that extra spark that I don't know. When it came out, it got pretty mixed reviews. Now it's considered a classic, but I, I see why it got mixed reviews when it came out. But uh, the backgrounds were originally slated to be <laughs> um, painted by Mary Blair, but this was 1953. And it was about that period where she got tired of doing movie work and uh, went off and did children's books, so they couldn't use her for this movie. I want to say they brought they had her involved in Sleeping Beauty. Maybe that was maybe that's where she was involved in the earlier version. I, I don't know the timeline on that, but. The arc was still phenomenal. I mean, again, it's, and I think another one of those notes too, where at, at the time it comes out and it's got a bunch of criticism. And I also have to imagine that at the time this comes out, you're thinking, man, animation is going to just keep getting better and better and better. But in reality, like it takes a big nosedive, right? At a certain point, it gets almost like simpler 
and you get less detail and less planes and less budget for like the animation department and corners get cut, you know, once there's corners to be cut. So <clears throat> I guess like that's part of the reason why you look back and it's considered a classic is because that trajectory of all these improvements that Disney and other companies keep making in animation over those years, it doesn't just continue on like a climb, right? It actually kind of peaks at a certain point and that might be a whole different debate, but like it, it kind of drops a little bit around like the seventies maybe, and then maybe drops a little bit more around the eighties and then kind of like jumps back up in the nineties. We'll get through all of those, but it doesn't just continuously climb. I think that's part of the reason why these older ones are so classic because they were putting their all into it. Um, it doesn't seem like at least in, in the lady and the tramp, I can't point my finger and say, man, they really cut part of the budget there and they didn't give it their all. So I think this is still in like those peak era movies for them. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, one thing that was happening at this time though, is uh, we did have like, um, I was about to say Burt Ward. That's not right. That's Robin. Um, anyway, there is some animators, uh, some Disney defectors, some folks from Warner brothers had found like kind of, you know, uh, Fred Ward there, you know, like the Bullwinkle style where it's extremely cheap, very stylish, but, you can get an audience for that just like you can for a Disney movie. So uh, some, you know, what Warner brothers by the sixties was definitely cutting like half the corners on their Looney tunes. I mean, those look like garbage in the sixties. So, I mean, I, I love the hell out of the Rocky and Bullwinkle show and a whole bunch of the, the poorly animated ones. So <laughs> no, no, that's why I brought Bullwinkle first. Cause that is great stuff. So when Disney has, you know, we're like putting our all and spending large yeah. budgets on these, you know, lush animations and, Bullwinkle showing up and knocking out of the park with, you know, um, like what, like three frames a second. <laughs> but I mean, there's really no Bullwinkle dynasty. So while, I mean, investing in those things that are called classics over and over and, and all the other business decisions that he and his global conglomerate Illuminati have made since then um, okay. have just like solidified this in like the DNA forever at this point. Whereas Bullwinkle is more like that thing that your dad you know, knew what it was, and it it le loses more and more momentum as every generation passes. I think I'm gonna hit a bit of a tangent here for a minute or two, if you don't mind. But there there was please, a bit of do. weird, a weird Bullwinkle legacy. A few years ago, I had to like actually get online and make sure this wasn't like some weird fever dream I had as a kid. But no, they were real. Um, there, I think there's still one in Washington or maybe on, in California, a uh, Bullwinkle restaurants. And there was about 20 to 30 of these scattered across the straits. There was one close to my parents' house. And I remember going there a few times. It was like Chuck E. Cheese's, but geared a little more towards adults. I I'd like to think like the office would go into a Bullwinkle's after work and get hammered. And they, they had like the animatronic sort of like Chuck E. Cheese, you know. Um... Now, is this officially licensed Bullwinkle or is this like a knockoff? Like, did, like were they, you know. It was this license and they paid for it and the Bullwinkle IP owners were aware of it? I'm pretty sure they were. Um, I mean, okay. it was it was the proper characters. I, th I think they were screening the animation and, and there were enough of these that it, they were mildly successful for a time. Not Did they not have quite... to wear like little Bullwinkle horns as they served you or anything like that? Oh, I don't remember that. I just remember there being a lot of surreal touches in line with the cartoons like in the restaurants. Again, I'm working on memories when I was like, you know, like six years old and, and a few years ago, I was like, was that a real thing? Or was that like some bizarro dream I had? So, um, I'm, I'm false quick... memory syndrome. Exactly. I, I kind of wondered if that was the case. Oh, it looks like they still have one in Oregon. Okay. <laughs> that one is very off brand. That one is not licensed in any way, but the, the ones in the eighties, I believe were, yeah, now it's just Bullwinkle's Bullwinkle and Portland family fun center in Wilsonville, Oregon. If anyone wants to visit, um, Interesting. See if the attractions still have the bizarre animatronics or not, because that that's definitely what stuck in my mind. Because it's Chuck E. Cheese's, but you know, with characters you actually know. Yeah, it's looking like the current iteration is just like basically retaining the name, but not the. Uh, oh, they got a, they got a bullwinkle at the bottom of the page, but yeah, it looks like it's now just an icon. Where in the eighties it was like these weird active restaurants with the characters and things. So. Yeah, like I, I do remember one dining room being set up to look like a Canadian Mountie station, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was, it, one of the reasons I, I remembered it is because I was like, it was better than Chuck E. Cheese's, like by far. 
Although now those are fighting words, my oh, my friend. No, I love the Chuck E. Cheeses. Those are great, but <laughs> the Bullwinkles was just like, yeah, yeah, that that was restaurants. Let's put that in the eighties. Fair enough. That was definitely nothing close to. I mean, um, because I grew up in this around the same time, but I was on the East Coast and upstate New York, and Chuck E. Cheese was all over the place. I there was definitely no Bullwinkles around us. Okay, I found I found a a rare footage of the restaurant. Oh yeah, yeah, it's got the try. I'm looking at an image now with the animatronics. It's got it's all Canadian Mountie. We got Dudley Do Right in the left. It looks like the Country Bears basically, with uh, the left triptych being uh, Dudley Do Right. The right one, I can't quite tell who that is. And then Bullwinkle on a, is playing a banjo with um, Rocky playing a uh, soapbox bass in the in the center. Okay, I mean so. the showroom itself sounds far superior to the Chuck E. Cheese showroom. Yeah, yeah. So I will, it, it, I will grant you that. I guess uh, when I was five or six, I could pick up that. I guess they're kind of nicking the the country bears a little bit, but making it like a full restaurant, but with that level of detail, which Chuck E. Cheese definitely doesn't have because four year olds couldn't care less, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm kind of saying that this one is. Um... <clears throat> okay, th- thematically, they were way more consistent, which actually sounds kind of cool, because uh, because also I don't know for you, but at least in like the '80s going to like a fast food restaurant wasn't necessarily like fast food and that it was just a uh, drive-by most of the i mean growing up most of them didn't even have drive throughs you would go in and sit but it was like a whole event and you know it was like a special restaurant as as a kid maybe for adults it, it felt uh, a little bit you know less uh special but it's it's not the same now as where you just kind of go and you wait in line you grab your stuff and and you're good um it like you know there was so much more emphasis on the toys and the play place and like um the little you know the stupid crown that it came with Hmm. that was like a whole part of like a ritual almost that doesn't exist as much not that it was a great ritual to instill but nonetheless it was it was one that's not there as much anymore yeah this one included apparently bullwinkle saloon and fun bar so clearly it was not quite as kitty oriented as chuck e cheese but uh you know kids could definitely be entertained i i was but i you know, was probably a weird kid did so they have the arcade to go with it too i'm pre- come on it's the 80s of course they had to yeah, have at least yeah, five okay. machines <laughs> um anyway that, I'll, I'll close the tangent it does look like if you try to visit the one in oregon now it's pretty lame uh but if you do want to transport back to 1985 atlanta you'll have a pretty cool experience if you search for the bullwinkles <laughs> restaurant but yeah, now it doesn't have that ornate theming and stuff anymore. It's just, you know, like like somebody painted something on the wall. So it doesn't look like the same thing. Let's get into a bit of your notes on Lady and the Tramp then. Because okay. I kind of, like I was watching, I was, you know, we, we were doing the occult Disney thing, trying to look for the, the you know, the deeper images, meanings. And I, I was kind of pulling my hair <laughs> out looking for that in here for the most part. Um, yeah, no, same here. And honestly, I'm, I I wasn't going to just try to like bend over backwards and get silly trying to draw connections. Um, so I'll, I'll point out the places where I wanted the most to, to draw connections, but I didn't necessarily go down any major rabbit holes. So the, this one and also Fox and the Hound to a lesser degree, um was very straightforward i mean it's just like you sit your kid down in front of this movie and you walk away and like you know they're baby they're getting babysat by a vhs at least <laughs> in the 80s 90s yeah where i guess this i mean i guess that's the thing why the uh, call it disney thing kind of gets people's you know that that sort of phrasing would get someone's attention because yeah you're seeing your kids and what are they actually seeing are they seeing some weird masonic tale you know in secret and i'm gonna say lady and the tramp they're probably not this does seem i was like... trying my hardest man and there, there's a couple in here but you're you're even gonna be like that's a stretch and i'm gonna say yeah is an absolute stretch <laughs> okay well let, let's preface that it's an absolute stretch and now let's have fun because it's fun to think about this sort of stuff <laughs> okay so so the the first one is again 1909 um is essentially when this Uh, took place and at first i was trying to be all clever about it and figuring out like oh when did this particular type of phone exist and oh there was a lot of horse and carriages when was that common and you know the different devices they had uh baby bottles where the the mother had left a bunch of bottles on a windowsill and then i was like you know let me just google when did lady and the tramp take place and it's like bam 1909 here's the reasons behind it so people have already deduced pretty much the exact year that it takes place and it doesn't hurt that it was also 
um, based on some books that also kind of took place around a similar time. So 1909, almost definitively. But then my mind went to this one scene when I'm looking, you know, I'm looking through, there's no owls or any cool like symbols or weird all seeing eyes and like the banisters inside the house and the, the background and the paintings are all very, very mundane and, and tame, right? Like all of the focus really is on just the dogs that were moving around and being animated. The only thing that really stood out is that in one scene, the dad is hanging up a Yale poster and I was already looking out for a Yale something because I, I noticed a few pillows in the background had a big Y, but most of them felt a little bit abstract. Like maybe I'm looking into it. Then I saw the Yale pendant and I immediately looked up what was the class 1909 skull and bones, you know, Yale. Um, but I mean, there's, there was no other connection beyond trying to, to drill deeper in there, but you can clearly tell that based on the, the, you know, the fact they're going on a vacation as soon as they have the kid, uh, the fact they've got this really nice house with it's, you know, packed jam full of artwork and all kinds of cool artifacts and stuff. Um, I think there's like a piano or something in one of the rooms. So they've got money. He went to Yale. So I'm just going to say this dude is a hundred percent skull and bones. No question about it. <laughs> he's a Yale man. Well, I did write early on as he, you know, he's a bit of an asshole towards the dog, isn't he? You know, it's like in star Wars, if you're mean to the droids, that probably means you're evil. <laughs> well, well, so this also though, I feel is like a really good insight into a completely different way that people look at and raise animals. Cause, cause if you took someone, I mean, and I'm thinking in 1950s, but hell, 1909, if you took someone from 1909 that was very nice to their dog, you know, on like the bell scale, if they're towards the the right end of the bell, of like being nice to your dog, not crazy, you know, building them like a whole entire interior house with air conditioning or anything. But then you show them just like a normal pampering dog owner in 2022, like it would feel extreme to them. So rewinding back to 1909 it was kind of showing you that you buy the, this puppy and oh yeah we love it brand new christmas morning and you're immediately getting like thrown in a different room in the dark completely away on the other side of the house from your people and here's like a newspaper to pee on um but i it feels like a different mentality and even that was probably being like extra nice at the time here's an interesting little poke i guess for um 1955 um they 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 definitely point out Sundays are fun days. You know, they're not going to church or anything, which in the fifties, usually you're showing everyone, you know, you know, doing their, their Sunday duty and going to church where these folks are ready for a ride in the country. They're, they're, they're not in for any of that. Well, this is before you had to prove that you weren't a communist publicly constantly. Right. I think it's about the same time you did actually. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, we talk about, you know, the fifties sort of vibe. I, I also do my twilight zone podcast and the original twilight zone seems to be like taking time to deconstruct the 50s where this pretty much has that like very disney 50s vibe except for that one little piece where they are clearly made sure not to be you know church attenders i mean again it, it felt very like anyone could watch this and not be offended i didn't really see a whole lot of places to be offended i mean i guess in 2022 maybe if you really wanted to be offended you could find some <laughs> instances of that and actually those are probably the the main parts when and you said you didn't watch the live action cgi remake um the main parts when i was watching that and i was like why didn't they do this part it's like oh probably because someone found that offensive do we want to get the pizza guy yeah. with the pasta? Yeah, I mean, why? And just the song itself, man. You know, like that's a more the pizza pie in the sky. Like, come on. Um, it was it was almost like, why would you leave all of that extra, like the part that people love the most, like the earwig? But think about it more. It's like, okay, I get it. Like, how come that? Where did that movie Super Fragile, you know, Super Fragile Casualist Expialidocious <laughs> come from? Let's. How come there's not more of that out there? <laughs> Well, um, maybe they were just like, no, it's Dean Martin or nobody singing that song. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's always debate if Dean Martin was like actually drunk on stage or or just doing a shtick. I'm sure it's somewhere in between. But uh, there, there's it's the only surviving video with like all of the Rat Pack, and he comes out and bows to the audience and bashes his head on the microphone and and looks really shocked for about two seconds. So I'm gonna think 
that looks like a guy coming on stage a little smashed <laughs> or he's just really good at it so either, either very he's... functional very functional alcoholic if so right yeah yeah exactly so um yeah yeah there's not again we're like picking at straws to find anything that kind of like has any incendiary fire in this uh, i mean it it starts at christmas which um and it starts and ends at christmas which is always interesting um just to throw out like just christmas itself is a very occult holiday especially standing for you know new life coming into the world and that's exactly how they show it both times so it's you know having this this new puppy brought into this family and then at the very end, more puppies brought into the family. They both happen on Christmas. And it's probably also just because movies sell better at Christmas and people go to movies at Christmas. And um, it also explains the dynamic of like, why is this dog being gifted? Uh, you don't have to kind of explain the backstory. You just show the Christmas tree and presents. And it's like, okay, I understand. You don't have to explain it further. Um, but that was it, you know, stand out. Another thing, too, is they constantly refer to the dog's license, which is obviously like the tag, but they mention it as if it's like a big deal. Like, oh, we have to go and get the license for this dog, which I guess you still do now. You just bring your dog and they get chipped. And if they, you know, run away, they get scanned so they can be returned to you. Um, but it just sounded so much more official the way that they were doing this and the fact that there's like this dog catcher that's almost treated as if uh, like a police officer uh, from the point of view of the dogs. So it, I don't know. It, and they all show it off. Like once they get the license, it's very much like, oh, look, I'm registered with the state. Look how, you know, how quickly I got mine. Like, oh, wow. You know, your your owners must really love you. They've registered you so quickly. Um Oh yeah, other notable Christmas movies, of course, being Die Hard and Prometheus. Um, <laughs> but uh, okay, Gremlins. I, I I forgot because you you sound stupid if you're offended because he's using the word correctly. But yeah, uh, Tramp does refer to Lady as as bitch like a gangster rapper. <laughs> yeah, yep. come on, bitch. <laughs> Which I actually that's probably my favorite thing about this movie. <laughs> Well, and he reconfirms it too because after they get out of, or after she goes to jail and, and she's asking about him, finds out that he's got like six or seven other girlfriends out there. So it very much was, you know, on par with the name. <laughs> so, uh, did the 2019 version do that? Can you get away uh, with that now? <laughs> I mean, so it, I mean, it was the same name, right? But it was. It wasn't exactly emphasized as much. I'll, I'll get into the live action. I got a couple other notes on the cartoon, and then I'll talk about some of the differences that stood out to me. It's not a whole lot more. Okay. Um, one of my first detective clues before I just decided to give up and Google it was I also saw um, Uncle Tom's Cabin opera or like a play that was on the sign outside of the uh, Italian restaurant. Um, so that also kind of gave an indication like that's what was popular in the 1909 era as you were going around um and then they also there was a, a couple allusions to like death in here although it doesn't it doesn't go directly into it and if um you read some more about some of the source material they get a little bit more explicit uh, especially when you get to the pound and if your owners don't come and get you in time you like you don't come back and they they do a little bit of nod to that and there's also a little bit darker in the live action remake they get for that one the house um, in the country all that yeah they're growing up to the farm <laughs> uh the other one the the baby um it was so funny because you know they have this newborn baby and i think at most six months pass by and they decide like we're just gonna go on a three-day vacation and it wasn't like an emergency or doing anything specific it was just like just had this baby I'm ready to take a break for three days and they have the aunt come over to babysit, which is an important thing is one of the, the weird differences that I'm going to point out in live action, but it, it's like nothing that I've just described sounds that out of the ordinary. Maybe it was a little bit early, but you know, someone needs to take a break for three days, a long weekend, whatever, have the aunt come over, watch your kid, right? The aunt brings over her cats maybe not a fan of a dog, but everything that happens afterwards kind of makes sense within the framework of this original movie, right? But it does seem weirdly irresponsible, especially in 1909 when, you know, half your kids probably still don't make it. <laughs> if, if you get over the, yeah, if you get over the fact that it was like, maybe she just needed to work some things out, right? There was no necessarily like a word for like postmortem or any of the other things that you go through. So maybe they just had to take a three-day vacation, 
work stuff out, come back. But other than that, like nothing really weird happens. And Again, they are very bourgeoisie. First up, they are very the bourgeois. Wall. They got plenty of cash. Yeah, I mean, this guy went to Yale. He's got a nice house. Um, the weird thing is that in the live action remake, it's different. They actually follow some of the same story beats, but they bring the baby with them, and they're calling the aunt over just to dog sit the puppy. And there's no other reason for the aunt to be there. And what's weird about that is that like all the other things still happen, like the dog, like the cats still make a uh, havoc because the aunt brings her cats over to dog sit and blames the dog every time something goes wrong and the dog runs away. And like, it follows some of those same beats, but in the cartoon, it makes sense because the aunt's there to watch the baby. So of course she's kind of like not keeping a super great eye on the dog and blaming the dog for stuff. But when you're specifically inviting your aunt over to dog sit and like, here, keep my dog safe, keep an eye on my dog. And then to like let all the same things happen and blame the dog and kick the dog out. It just has such a weird like spin to it. Like you, like the ant becomes like a horrible evil villain in my mind in the live action remake, which actually she's not written that way, but she almost was written that way in the, in the uh, 55 animation. The original plan was for her to be a vindictive mother-in-law. And uh, as they were developing the movie toned her down to being kind of like a, Oh, she's not wrong. She's just, you know, like getting misunderstanding things. Aunt. Well, even even if she wants to be nasty, though, right? Just the fact that she was invited over specifically to be the dog sitter <laughs> just makes her that much more nasty in the live yeah. action one. Maybe it's like a nod back to like, hey, the first one was going to be real nasty, so we'll make this one worse. But, but well, that, that I... stood out. That was one of those weird things. It was like, why did they do that? Um, because it, I don't know, it just threw off so many other story beats and it like destroyed some of the logic, I guess. Yeah. I, as someone who loves to sit down every week and talk about the, the anime classics, I, I have basically, um, developed an allergy to the, to the live act, to even the idea of the live action ones. I, I saw Alice, I saw Maleficent, I, I saw the jungle book and then I was kind of like, what? You're doing the Lion King again? See, like, I haven't I haven't seen any of those. So, so this series is my opportunity to do it because I'm gonna watch okay. the classic and then I'll watch the new one. Well, um, how how do, how is the comparison then? Uh -uh. This one's horrible. My main note <laughs> is why would anyone like tr I truly I have a note somewhere in here that's like, oh, here it is. What kind of monster would put this on? or would put this version on instead of the cartoon version, you would absolutely have to just be a monster and like you hate your kids or you hate yourself or you're doing it for a reason other than you want a good experience out of it. Like there's absolutely no reason to watch the live action version of this other than morbid curiosity for the first time. And if everyone watches it more than once, they should absolutely be put on a list. So I, I guess it, it's three year run. It's finished now because apparently the live action Pinocchio is now the one to fit that bill. <laughs> well, I mean, this one, it would be hard for a live action remake to get worse than this one, just because like they took they changed parts that didn't make sense changing. They took some of the best parts of the cartoon, specifically some of the the songs and stuff, and just re completely removed them and replaced them with generic versions, but also the weird uh, uncanny valley version of these dogs is creepy borderline like i don't know like like it looks real in some places but they also didn't add any of that kind of like disney cartoony magic that makes them cute and adorable so the whole time i'm actually just like if someone kills this weird alien robotronic dog in front of me like i'm not really going to feel bad there's no cute aspect to this not like and we'll get to the opposite of that with Fox and the Hound, right? Like the cutest little adorable with like the, the cutest voices. These ones, like the voices aren't cute. The CGI isn't cute. The things they do are just like, just let the, the pound take them away. Like I'm over these dogs. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I might've mentioned in the last episode, but I, I've basically come to the idea of thinking of these newer live action versions as being like Disney buying savings bonds. <laughs> because by making it, they do also rekindle the original version, yep. right? Yep. And they can continue selling that stuff in their park. People still want to do And now people are, are watching both on Disney Plus to compare the two. And, you know. <laughs> exactly. So they end up making, I mean, let's face it. They still usually make a lot of cash off of these. 
plus they get to um resurrect their their older ip so in a way i mean you can you could see like from a strict like accounting point of view like it's kind of genius it just makes for some terrible movies <laughs> well and on top of that too i mean you we still have this weird model that we're definitely growing away from but current day this model more or less exists where you can put all this money into the movie production and literally make it back and then some on opening weekend or opening week and you're making that money before people even know if it's good or bad right so before yeah. you even have a chance to know it's like the word like you know the cats movie comes out or something um and outside of people paying money after knowing it's bad um like a lot of the chances they've already recouped all their costs. They're making profit. They've got the ancillary McDonald's toys getting pumped out. So like all of this is happening regardless if the movie's good or bad, but that might not be the case, you know, in our lifetime, there might actually be a change to that where like something has to come out day one streaming and people start watching it and the reviews come out and everyone says it's horrible and maybe people won't watch it out of morbid curiosity, but that also might turn into the new, you know, like if Disney just always releases a, an ho absolutely horrible CGI remake of something, everyone will hate watch it instead of, you know, <laughs> get excited to watch it. They're just like excited to hate it. So I think we're at that stage now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I don't hear many good things about these these newer ones. So. Well, well, I don't know how many remakes came before this one. But uh, this one sets a like this one would set the bar. Like if you wanted to find where you know where it started getting really bad, I would at least say this is one of those ones to start with. Yeah, of course I think this and Pinocchio are straight to streaming, so that's a little weird because um, that way you don't make the box office. <laughs> so it was also uh, thirty minutes longer than the cartoon, which is probably more of a standard just from when it came out. Yeah, most um, of these are. Like They're yeah, time out, like it, it they it just grew out. But man, that there was no reason for those thirty extra minutes to be in here, uh, whatsoever. They changed Jock from a boy to a girl, which didn't matter, but it also just didn't make sense. And also, the name tag was spelled J O C K, but the girl's name was Jacqueline, so it like made sense if you said it like a French way. But it was a Scotty, not a French dog. Um. So anyway, it was just it was like. A weird thing that was just like why is that different maybe just for the sake of changing and tweaking certain stuff here and there oh i i also was gonna say i, ha I haven't seen cats but i i will if the uh, butthole cut is available <laughs> i gotta say i tried to hate watch cats and i hated it so much i couldn't get through the first musical number it it legitimately just made me so uncomfortable that i wanted to do anything other like i would have just go and start doing dishes or something well, I saw, I instead saw a proper, of watching it i saw a proper production 20 years ago some family friends gave us some tickets to see you know like touring cats it was in atlanta at the fox theater and uh what would you think my, my dad and i were just sitting there like like what's happening because there's no <laughs> story to cats and we're like was it also a fever dream and in, in live yes. action yes it, it has no story it's basically just like kind of like yeah fever dreams to connect these really popular I, songs i did have the opportunity to see cats in uh new york when it was you know actually being played there but went to see like sesame street on ice instead so and i think yeah. that was a good trade-off yeah that's probably a good choice so yeah yeah I, I, the only one i saw like on broadway was les mis I, again i'm not a broadway fan but there it's it's got a story you can follow production's impressive blah 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 right and and cats i guess the production's impressive and everything it's like what's happening do you have to be really into like have a totally bizarro cat fetish and and you love these songs i guess is how you get into it <laughs> honestly the only way that i can make it make sense for me so that i can move on is that like the same people that would watch the room religiously <laughs> which i do get i understand the room and i've watched it you know a few times myself and even like the riff tracks versions and stuff but cats man even if i wanted to watch it just to just to make fun of it or like scoff at it it was it's not worth getting through at least in my opinion it wasn't worth it yeah, you fox the and the how live action remake is in that same bucket it might not be at the very top where cats is at but it's it's in that bucket do you want to segue to fox and the hound or did you mean to say lady and the tramp no no, no that's uh no so, sorry yeah uh, lady and the tramp but that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it Okay, I uh, just we're going to be talking about the voices a little more for Fox of the Hound. So I'll just note 
finishing off Lady and Tramp that uh, Peggy Lee was one of the voices and did a bunch of the music for this because if I don't say that, someone might be like, hey, you didn't mention that. <laughs> well, and, and ironically, <laughs> she uh, didn't get any, cr- she didn't get very much credit for her role in that movie because at the time the contract said that the VHS didn't exist, right? There was no such thing as you're going to watch this at home again. So every every kind of premise was that in these contracts every time they re-aired the movie they would get some and then when the transcript uh was released she was supposed to get some royalties from the transcript because that was the other that was the only way that people would be able to like enjoy this at home was some kind of transcript version which was somewhat common i guess when vhs came out she tried to make an argument that the VHS constituted a transcript. Therefore she should get royalties and the Disney company just like blocked her for many, many years. And it took her a while. And I think eventually she got like 3.3 million, which seems absolutely minuscule compared to, you know, someone's having a role in like a modern Disney movie. It seems like they'd have more than 3.3 million in royalties over the course of many decades. But mm-hmm. uh, that was interesting. And she had a quote somewhere that was something like, well, I guess the the mice needs its cheese. Right on. <laughs> the, the mouse needs its cheese. Moving on to Fox and the Hound. I, I'm, I'll i just straight out say I did actually like, I think that was your point of pairing them in one way. Fox and the Hound, uh, story-wise, has a little more kick to it. The characters have a little more kick to it. I mean, Tramp Big was time. kind of a fun character, but otherwise, this one just seems... I mean, the, uh, Fox and the Hound kind of feels like a better version of Bambi in some ways. <laughs> well, and, and honestly, th- so this note didn't make a whole lot of sense unless you give it a little bit of thought, but Fox and the Hound... Uh, Disney decided to scale back some of the violence because it's because this one's actually based a little bit one for one on a book. Um, well, not one for one, but it takes the same beats as the book that it's based on. However, the book is way more violent. And because of the criticism that he got from Bambi and killing the mom off um, a little bit into the movie after the audience kind of, of like, you know, like falls in love with the mom a little bit and then he kills her. And this one, he not only does he scale back the violence from the book, but he gets rid of the mom like in the credits so that the audience doesn't have time to bond with the mom or the dad. It's not necessarily clear the gender of of like the parent that drops them off. Um, They just kind of like run off screen. There's a shot. Birds fly and you never see him again. And then you're left with uh, the fox in the beginning. But that was specifically because he didn't want to push that edge again because of all the backlash from Bambi. Yeah, and and then they chased it with the black cauldron, did they? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's that's well, that's corporate thinking, I suppose. Um. <laughs> well, and again, we, we're skipping ahead, so this is 1981. We're not in the 50s anymore. Right, right. And technically, we should have waited, but it just seemed again. I, I think it makes sense to talk about this one now. So, um, this is kind of the changing of the guard for Disney. Uh, production started around 76 77 with the remaining nine old men on it um uh it was it was their last they 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 did their animation basically retired so um uh, who was it ali ali smith i think was one of them who are the two that were still on there production there we go Oh, I'm still looking at Lady and Tramp. Okay. Anyway, this had the last of the the nine old men. It had uh, Dom Bluth and his team working on it. So, and it stands out big time. It stands out big time, and I don't think. And they also left in the middle. I mean, uh, and I don't think they actually got credited on for Fox and the Hound, even though, yeah, like you say, you can totally see it. But uh, Bluth would get his revenge by basically kicking Disney's ass and animation until Little Mermaid. So. <laughs> Uh, if you want 80s animation, you basically, uh, I feel like that's probably the better tack to take uh, with the Bluth stuff. But uh... And there were so many characters in this that we start seeing recurring in future uh, animations. And it also, like, this isn't exactly like the frame for frame tracing of, you know, Baloo the Bear and um, other examples of that. But some of the character designs are like, you know, almost one for one with other characters. Um, and then I, I mentioned the passing of the torch. So it's, uh, 76, 77, you have Don Bluth and, and the remaining nine old men working on it. 
Bluth leaves under not great circumstances. The nine old men are not the, the remaining ones retire. And then the back end of this movie has the the touch ups and the final animation being done by people like, you know, John Laster and Tim Burton, sort of the newer guard of uh uh well Tim Burton's of course his own thing, but this is when he was just a straight up, you know, weirdo animator in the uh, Disney stable. So uh, apparently he didn't fit in so well there, but he did a lot of work for them before he left. <laughs> and of course John Laster uh ran with the ball until i did john laster properly get canceled a few years ago i don't remember it's hard to remember who's canceled or not anymore <laughs> you can just assume yes <laughs> yeah I, I know there was some weird scandal with him but i don't remember if it held traction or not i, I think they did kind of uh, make him less less figure heady at pixar at that point so before that anytime with pixar you get john laster and his hawaiian shirt telling you something i don't remember seeing much of that recently so so, so I'm curious, you mentioned that for Lady and the Tramp, that wasn't necessarily a movie that you ever saw, and it was probably rightfully, you know, aimed at like a slightly different demographic. What about this movie? I'm pretty sure I conflated it with um, The Secret of Nim, which makes sense. Fox and the Hound? <laughs> yeah, just because I would have okay. seen them around the same period of time. Some of the styles very similar. Both are good movies. So um, I think Nim is is a little more like scarring, if I remember, a little more disturbing because they're experimenting on rats. But <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a whole tangent we could go on with uh, Nim because uh, there's some maybe arguably like a Jurinochrome esque references in there where they have to extract like a life force and um you know like use it to perpetuate sort of like an elite society that leeches on like the 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 dregs of society so there's a few very dark connections in that one i think and i remember even being four or five years old and of course not sinking there thinking about adrenochrome and elites but definitely no, picking up no. that <laughs> something nefarious and sinister was was in the depths of that movie this one it i had guess some, uh, it had some darkness to it yeah fox and the hound um is I, I guess like a little more naturalistic, you know, without the blood that even Bambi had. It's it's weird to say when Bambi is the more hardcore movie, but sure. <laughs> um, well, and, w- and which is interesting, especially when you compare the book that Fox and the Hound was based on, because the book goes into way darker territory, which I think is probably some more of the interesting notes that we'll get into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Oh, where, where was my thought running? More naturalistic. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The one change that apparently was kind of fixed in post is uh, the chief, the older hound dog, actually was supposed to die uh, when he spilled into the river or whatever, which would explain why, um, you know, Copper and his master are like so, you know, because he kind of turns on his best friend at that point, right? Where, well, he just killed my mentor. That makes more sense. But, uh, in the animation, you find that you do get a shot of Chief with a little cast, and his his eyes are moving a little. So if kids are paying attention, they'll know and they they have him dead. like playing it up a little bit, which kind of implies that he's not that hurt. But you know, it's it's not as bad as it looks. But yeah, it, until pretty late in the game, he was supposed to die, and it actually was kind of a big argument among the filmmakers if Chief dies or not. The the final. Um, I think the, the the final the buck stops here statement was we've never killed a main character in a Dis- in an anime a Disney movie and we're not going to start now. Uh okay yeah I guess Bambi's mom wasn't really a main character so she doesn't count. Yeah yeah I agree with that that's yeah. that's an interesting take. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean they, they don't uphold that though and and I guess like Lion King is an obvious example but man Lion King did it right in my opinion. Or, or you could say that uh, that eighties Japanese movie with the white lion, whose name is escaping me, but <laughs> my my wife hates the Lion King. She's you know because she she is Japanese. She grew up with the eighties uh, 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 the Mulan? white lion. Oh. Oh, no, no, the white lion. Um, here I'll. See I don't even think I've ever. I don't even think I've ever even heard of that before. Okay, that's this is a lion. Disney movie called The White Lion. No, no, no. This is a Japanese anime. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, hold on, uh, King. Japan. Let's see. Maybe it'll just give me the Japan Japanese white. I think it's white lion in that case. So it looks a little different. But when you have shop like comparisons to the designs and stuff, you're like, oh yeah, they were kind of a uh, Kimba the white <laughs> Kimba Kimba the white lion. 
So that's Cuba. We'll have to we'll have to tie that one in to when when we get to the Lion King. We'll have that, to do a actually comparison. we will. Yeah, we'll have to double those because uh, Kimber okay. the White Lion also has the benefit of being. I mean, the Lion King is a good movie, but this is also a good movie, and it was ten years earlier. So, okay, I'm <laughs> so looking forward to that one. That that is why my wife hates the Lion King. <laughs> it's kind of like if you you know grew up with Woody Woodpecker, and then you suddenly you're getting Whoopi Woodpecker shoved down your throat, which did happen in a Japanese amusement park. Their um <laughs> their mascot was Whoopi Woodpecker, so that was kind of a mind blower. Nasu Highland, if anyone's interested. Fun place, oh, weird mascot. A, an interesting note that I, I picked out on this one is that the woodpecker's name is Boomer, and Boomer has a stutter. And I thought that was so clever because like the stutter is like a phonetic version of the sound that the woodpecker makes when they're like knocking on wood. It's got this like just this repetitive ba 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 ba. And the way that this guy talks. Um, the stutter just emulates that same cadence as when he's pecking on wood, which just felt like such a really cool, tiny little detail. Oh, the first instance of okay, boomer. Okay, that makes her because I, I, oh, yeah. So I sent you a, a picture because there was a, a certain shot and it wasn't in the same context, but they're looking for like a worm or something. And the you know, boomer's talking to his sidekick, uh, Dinky. And Dinky's just acknowledging him, and he's like, "Okay, Boomer." But that's what's in the screenshot is "Okay, Boomer," which might be the very first instance in any modern media of the phrase "Okay, Boomer." <laughs> um, check original Battlestar. They might they had a Boomer, so they might have one like a year or two okay, earlier. <laughs> we'll have to see <laughs> if there's specifically a statement that just says "Okay, Boomer." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, know. I, and I was going to say the the boomer woodpecker here the way that he was designed reminded me so much of the the red guys in the movie Labyrinth they're called like fireys I think uh, or the fire gang do you know what I'm talking about I think so Labyrinth is weird in that I'll listen to the Bowie songs a lot but I don't watch the movie that often <laughs> <laughs> well there, there's a, a creepy kind of like evil red bird looking thing and it yeah, looks just yeah. almost identical to this cartoon version of the woodpecker yeah labyrinth is weird because uh, again i'm a giant bowie fan too and, and and i love jim henson it's a cool movie but the pacing is slow i guess i don't know whenever i put on labyrinth it seems to take forever <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. It just it doesn't move quickly enough, but I, the visuals, I think, are just worth it. Yeah, yeah. You know, not not the greatest production for Bowie, but it was that was the first Bowie I heard. And I, uh, you know, I was into music. And I didn't get in. I didn't really get into Bowie until like 1997 because I was still terrified of him from, from Labyrinth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so one of the uh, another things that stood out here, not the character or the voice as much, but that Dinky and woodpecker um and boomer to a slightly lesser degree but they're like the most classic new york street urchins in a, in a way of like the way they talk like for example one of the things is uh dinky is asking boomer you know do i look like a worm but he says it do i look like a worm and they all just like have that exact kind of vernacular as they're talking and, and they just clearly come from a very specific place and time which i just thought was kind of entertaining like that um this was the most expensive production disney production animated one at least when it came out I, is this the first case of the animated movie with the quote unquote all-star cast i can't think of one before this that would have such so uh just just to make sure everyone's down we got mickey rooney you know old school hollywood showing up as todd or older todd at least um Copper gets a, gets a double kick because we have Kurt Russell voicing Copper, who was still on contract with Disney at this point. You know, they, they brought him up through the 70s, right? But this is also the same year he did the thing. So that kind of blew my mind thinking about it. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, the thing and, and the fox and the hound were like his 81 films or something. That's insane. Uh, and then a very a very young Corey Feldman is the young copper, so I guess he wouldn't be all star at the time, but we know him now. Um, I, I guess is I'm recognizing some character actor names, but hey, between Mickey Rooney and Kurt Russell, that's that's pretty notable well, for and, an eighty one. Well, well, and I was gonna say beyond all of like those notable names, my absolute favorite, like as soon as I heard the voice, I was like, I know that voice, and I knew exactly who 
they played as another character elsewhere. And I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but it's it's either Pat Butram or Pat Butram. Uh, do you know the the pronunciation of his name? I'm not sure as as Chief. So okay. so he plays Chief, but is like not only does Chief look like this character, but it was ah. voiced by the exact same character, which was the Sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood. And if you just put Chief in that freaking outfit, bam, you've got Sheriff of Nottingham, and it's the exact same voice. Oh, sorry. My my awe was actually because the picture it came up was Mr. Ha- Haney and Green Acres. <laughs> <laughs> so which he also did so um not quite all-star but definitely he has not a, all-star a, man but that that's the that at least for me quality. that was the most memorable voice out of all of them because because i mean you know kurt russell great you've got the name there and Corey feldman you've got the names but the voice you know of pat butram or butram sorry i mean i guess case in point is that i don't know his name as well but man his voice just stood out immediately and i was like i love that voice where's that voice from and i started looking up all the other instances you might have seen this wiki quote then which i'm just going to read off wiki which says uh he had a distinctive voice that in his own words never quite made it through puberty <laughs> so i was like yeah that okay that that fits about right but yeah <laughs> uh, um, and then the other thing too that that stuck out to me this one's a little bit more of a stretch but the lady that adopts um Todd the fox she looks so freaking similar to the witch in sword in the stone um maybe not like frame for frame but just the build and the eyes and everything it just it looks like a slightly drunker eviler version of this lady is widow just a title widow tweed or did her parents name her that cuz that would just be cruel <laughs> <laughs> i guess it's like oh she lives out in the outskirts of of town she's widowed well we, ha- we had this in lady in the tram too where i don't think the wife's name is ever mentioned it's it's noted as darling but that's only because the husband refers to her as darling not because her name is darling right so that's the dog perspective in your own uh, it's a lot i mean you do see their faces a little bit in lady in the tramp but for the most part it's you know down that dog level so um I, I suppose that's the reason why uh, here, of course, we, we get their faces quite, quite clearly on the screen the whole time. So they dropped it by now, but. And, and I found this um, interesting that big mama owl was a voice by Pearl Bailey. And she also does a song in here. And she was a very kind of famous musician at the time. Okay. So she, she would have been part of your all-star cast in 81. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, now now I'm seeing the picture of her, so I'm, I'm like, okay, I at least know who this is. Yeah. Uh the first African American to receive the Screen Actors Guild Life Achievement Award. So the presidential presidential medal of freedom. So yeah, yeah, okay. She can and go it's legitimately, in my opinion, the best song in the the movie. It's the best of friends song, right? Is there like before they transition into adults and they're just kind of playing around. It's not the the instrumental itself isn't it's very the best. 81 <laughs> yeah it's very 81 but the the lyrics and the singing are i think the best one out of this movie i can go with that um thinking a little more about the meanings in the movie uh like like i said my computer decided to scrap most of my notes but i do remember writing about um well i was watching kind of getting into mind sort of like some of the fantasy books science fiction books around the turn of the century stuff like the time machine or or the book version of wizard of oz which very much gets into you know the, the class struggle sort of thing which i felt actually was a bit of like the similar metaphor in here just how people can you know be in their own lot in life and they're not supposed to cross paths that sort of thing well th- that's interesting because i felt that also in the lady and the tramp obviously had like almost beating you over the head with the difference in class like the dogs themselves are you know pontificating about uh living in a nice house versus having to like eat scraps and stuff in this one there's a little bit of that aspect but as as we'll get into the the book um takes it to a whole extra level and there's almost like a meta aspect of you know changing times and classes which doesn't get that doesn't come across at all in the movie adaptation i i guess why it stuck to me more in the Fox and the Hound is because in the Lady and the Tramp, it's just the dogs are simply in the place where they are in human society. 
So it's actually the, the human classes that are affecting that the dogs are like this or like that. And here, I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, uh, copper is a hunter, a hunt, a hunt dog, right? I got that hound dog. But um, other than that, we're a little more out in the wild. You know, the animals themselves are kind of organizing themselves. That They're explaining yeah, true. They set their own to Todd that you can't associate with this dog because you guys are enemies. <laughs> And an interesting note on the name Todd. I didn't know this until I looked it up for this movie, but the name Todd actually means fox in Northern Middle English. And it originally um, was attributed to, you know, you had like a red haired, fire blooded, you know, kid. You name him Fox because of the red hair combined with, you know, like just wanting to be cunning and everything. But that's kind of where that the name todd originally came from because my first thought was like todd's just a weird you know name to be like the main character in this thing and i was like why todd and i just i love etymology so looking that up and that kind of caught me off guard so i thought that was interesting yeah i guess in modern sarcasm we'd be like ah that's just todd he's over there talking to chad you know (laughs) (laughs) one of the uh the name for the guys whose opinions you don't want that sort of thing i don't know (laughs) And, but, and you and you mentioned that the budget for this one was the highest once they got here, which must have gone almost all to the cast and obviously to some of the animation. And I'm, and I'm hoping to hear some more context that you've got for this. But this movie in particular, there were so many frames that were out of focus or that they would like show it at a much they would zoom in so much closer to the artwork as opposed to drawing a separate frame at a different level of detail um more so than i've seen in any disney movie so far that we've watched in this series what seems like for the most i mean there were probably a few people that stuck with the whole movie but yeah a lot of them i went to that voice cast because uh you have a few names there um also like you mentioned lady and the tramp they they started the film got a little burnt out when worked on sleeping beauty some came back and were reinvigorated this also had the two frame phases of production but phase one is everybody left so phase two it's the new animators just have to like okay we got this we've got this and you can see they have to assemble this old work and there's going to be some rough edges when you're taking someone else's work and trying to assemble it even if you're good at your job it's it's not going to be a completely smooth procedure i I think that's probably what you're seeing some of that but also i mean literally there's just some frames where it was missed like it had a picture of todd And it was missing the same dark outlines that was in every other scene. And this one, it was just like they skipped over some of the line art Mm -hmm. in the cell animation. And in some, it it almost looked like the camera wasn't completely focused straight ahead. It was like at an angle and um, things were literally out of focus. And then the very next cut uh, of the scene would be crystal clear in focus again, which made it all that more jarring. There was also... And I don't even count any of this as like a downside. I kind of like seeing some of those, you know, the extra like analog feel, I guess. But there were some frames where they got so close that, again, normally you would have like redrawn that scene at a different scale, at a different level of detail. But they get so close, you can almost see like the edges of like the paint and just like the original line art, which I found you know, very interesting because you almost never see it that close up. It's almost like you got like the 8K fully zoomed in version of some of these cells, which just kind of stood out like a sore thumb to me, not in a horrible way. Like it didn't take away from the, uh, like the enjoyment or anything and it all looked good, but it just stood out because it's not something that happens in the previous movies. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to just quote directly from wiki here again if you don't mind but a power struggle between the two directors and co-producer ron miller broke out over key section of the film with miller supporting the younger stevens miller instructed reitherman uh the original direct producer i guess to surrender reins over to the junior personnel but reitherman resisted due to a lack of trust in the young animators Uh, specifically you have ollie johnson uh who did make who did animate um Yeah, yeah, we we did. I think Ali Johnson did actually animate uh, Chief having much more drastic injuries or or death. I don't remember what the case is. So Randy Cartwright picks it up a few years later and has to change this animation to make sure that all the kids know that Chief is okay. So he's taking this finished animation and basically having to 
revise it as a junior animator. So they're basically, okay, to finish this film, it's already cost too much money. Uh, have the interns do it. Very and on top of that, kids. have them rework this like industry legends work after it's already been done and turned in and polished. So Go I ahead think, and like change it. <laughs> I think that's what you're saying. And also someone like Ali Johnson, he's going to kind of be used to some of these animatics we're reusing. You know, it's like it's like when you have a selection of pencil or hell i'll go with guitars i have a bunch of guitars i know what guitar i need for a certain sound right whereas if someone was to come in and start making music with my guitars they they wouldn't necessarily know which ones are capable of what and you're going to get that you know dropped edge here and there in a weird frame if we're talking animation yes and i didn't know any of that backstory and it does make a lot more sense now on like why some frames look just you know phenomenal and then in the very next cut all of a sudden it looks like garbage and then it goes back to looking good again it was just it's so weird to see those spliced in there and it, and at first it's like oh maybe it's just like a weird version i went and i tried looking at like multiple different versions uh that i could find of this movie and they all shared the exact same issues with the cuts so again don blues and his team their fingerprints are all over this especially in some of those character designs but they were not there for phase two. That's when the uh, the younger animators were brought in to finish. And he, he was not there for consultation because he did not leave Disney on good terms. So they had to take like some very good work and figure out what to do without any, you know, consultation from the guy that did it. And, and that's sure to cause a few dropped frames. So, so I think uh, story-wise, this one there's something about it where they just keep beating you over the head of like we're best friends and we're never gonna fight and we're always gonna get along like at a certain point i'm almost expecting them to say like and i'm never gonna grow up and learn how to hunt foxes and then miraculously turn that around and turn it into a big dramatic ending where i hunt you down and you die <laughs> like you know exactly what's going to happen. Even like a six-year-old could pick up on the foreshadowing that they just keep dropping over the head. You know, the songs and like just all the dialogue until they grow up is just leading to like, man, nothing's ever going to change in this world we live in is perfect, right? Like nothing's ever going to destroy this. Yeah, I mean, and we only get like what, really two or three minutes of them actually like uh, as friends, right? So, but... Yeah, it's kind of a primordial story. I think it's this is definitely one more about the journey than about the, the story, which you can contrast that with the book. The book could be a very different beast in that regard. Um, but this one, yeah, you just you don't really need to even think about the story beats when you're watching it because you just kind of plop along with them. But that is nice. You get to focus on all those character animations and, and what's going on, you know, solidly. The, this, they have the all-star cast, which can often lead to not as good a voice cast as if you hired voice actors but here it's serviceable every everything works so um it's i guess it's kind of like you know the the movie version of soup i mean honestly the the word serviceable is probably the the most you know appropriate here because watching it you know now and again 2022 watching this movie that came out in 81 none of those names necessarily impress me like i love kurt russell movies gray a, a tiny Corey feldman but none of that would make me want to re-watch this because it had kurt russell's voice in it nowhere near as much as you're like hey it's got that guy that did the voice from the sheriff of nottingham and robin hood i don't know his name but he's in this i'd be like i'm all in you know that would be the selling point here um so and i think there's something to be said for that that sometimes disney kind of like struck gold where they were just going for big names and then, you know, lightning in a bottle, Robin Williams again as the genie or something versus, you know, most other voices tend to just kind of be serviceable. What a great word for that. Is that like, it doesn't stand out. You might not necessarily remember who did that voice, um, but it doesn't stand out in a bad way either. Yeah. Like looking into the film, it just, it started to become so much more interesting as this like, massive like transitional sea change at disney and i was like oh and they got a serviceable film out of it so that's that's pretty you know pretty interesting I, yeah, I and, and not to be ignorant of the fact that obviously that brings people to go and see the movie so at the time in 81 these names were um well at least kurt russell was a much bigger draw i think to get everybody into you know kids and their parents and um 
that that is i was like oh and they chased with black cauldron but we were we were ranting about eyes at the beginning of this podcast he came in and was kind of like i think he did find fox and the hound being the newest release and being somewhat milk toast and hey you guys are making this harder edge one i was at paramount you know i was doing stuff like raiders let's do this i would absolutely love to see a live action fox and the hound remake based way closer to the book uh, almost like Milo and Otis style, you know. Okay, I'm I'm seeing here being too ironic, and I want a live action Fox the Hound, but not with CGI critters. I want I want people in like fur suits, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That, that you're going back to your Broadway roots now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. The Broadway Fox and the Hound that that certainly wouldn't work. Well, let's let's talk about the book a little bit. Um, uh, because I I you know I saw oh it's based on a book, but that. I again I focus more on the production when I was looking into it than the book. So So do, yeah. do you know anything about the book at all? Uh just it's a 60, 67 book it seems. It won mm-hmm. the Dutton Animal Book Award. Okay, but I'm just spitting off things on my screen. So, so uh, basically okay. no I don't. <laughs> so I I mean I can paraphrase. I just wrote a, I read a bunch of stuff on my screen too, but I read a bunch of it and I can paraphrase it uh without having to look too much of it up. The author who I don't know the name of off the top of my hand um had but he actually had a, a a couple of foxes that he lived with for a few months and sort of like watched the entire process mating and playing up to releasing them back into the wild and was absolutely studying all of the ways that animals interacted in nature. And he wanted to do any, he, he also went on hunting trips, specifically hawks, um, fox hunting trips to see how the dogs reacted. Because I guess as he's writing this, he wanted those action scenes where the foxes are running and the, the dogs are chasing him. He wanted to be as accurate as he possibly could. So he, he kind of like went through this almost like method actor style and lived with foxes and then lived with bloodhounds and then wrote this book as a result. But some of the interesting parts is that um, obviously he did not write this uh, with the intention to be a Disney screenplay. So the fox and the bloodhounds do not become friends. There's no point when they're friends there's not like the cute little um, version that we kind of get with the song and dance. Instead, um, they're always kind of being trained to hunt after this fox. And another weird thing that just it it threw me off as I was trying to like make notes for this, but Disney reverses the names and the ages of Copper and Chief. So in the book, unless I'm totally um, missing this, but I I had to reread this a few times to make sure this was the case. In the book, Chief is the younger one and copper is the older one but then the master gets attacked by a bear and he gets like bit on the shoulder or something and um copper the like the older one that's like been the og he doesn't stand up for the the master he doesn't like bark back at the bear or anything he just kind of freezes up while the younger chief is the one that barks at the bear so from that point on the master you know the hunter he takes in chief the younger one as his favorite and copper is always trying to play catch up and kind of reinstate his power as the alpha dog for the rest of the book and in the movie it's obviously switched copper's the young one chief's the old one and there's also not as much animosity of like this changing of the guard and it's also obviously missing that whole initial scene of them going out and the hunter getting attacked by a bear and one of them protecting him from it. So all that's missing, which I thought was an interesting part, but again, softening and they don't have any like humans get hurt in this one. Yeah. It's kind of interesting too. Cause uh, my first take on the story was, Oh, it's kind of like a class thing, but then it seems like the book is more of a, a cast thing. <laughs> well, no. So you're, you're actually right on the, the book does have some class in it, but, and I'm, I'm skipping to the end of the book to explain this aspect of it, but the book is really a lot more about urbanization and and it's talking against hunting and it's talking against just the sprawl of neighborhoods because in the book what happens is that there's this much deeper and non like this is like I'm not going to say not like kid friendly cuz it's not like violent or or profane or anything but it's just a much deeper mature sort of complex level that as the houses get spread out this hunter realizes that there's less and less animals for him to hunt. And he also has less income because as a hunter, 
you know, less animals, there's less people buying like animal fur. They're just like moving into regular houses and getting normal commodities and stuff. So like his world continuously starts shrinking to the point where he only has one dog left and he takes this one dog and they're just every day going out to hunt this fox, even though like there's almost like no place else to hunt. And the fox is kind of also dealing with the sprawling neighborhoods. So the book ends up being this like vicious commentary against urbanization of wild areas. So the guy was very much at heart, like a naturalist, but he was like an animal lover. And there's also sort of like an anti hunting sentiment to it of like, you know, we're removing this, this awesome part of nature not just through the hunting act, but just through living and, you know, being humans and building houses. I'm sitting here thinking about the the setting of this movie. This one's actually a lot more difficult to pin down than Lady and the Tramp, and I don't think it tells you. Um, so I had to look this one up, and apparently it's supposed to take... The book was written in, like, 67, but the movie takes place in, like, the 50s or the mid-50s, but... I was expecting to see like 1880s or something like they very much live in the out, you know, the outskirts of wherever the hell they're at. Um, they have that one. They have that one like jalopy. Right. So I was I was actually thinking 1930s. OK, <laughs> but yeah. So maybe a little closer because yeah, there's like the kind of broken down old timey car. You would have won. You would have won the trivia question on that one between yeah. the two of us for sure. OK, well, it's, uh, if it depends on how close you have to be for the answer to be correct. But <laughs> but but I mean, I, I guess so. But also, um, I think that they don't really strongly establish a whole lot of that. Okay. Yeah. I guess they did have cars that he was like running into the back. So it wouldn't have been the 1880s, but, uh, um, but the focus really is on nature and the animals growing through nature. And honestly, everything that I wanted more out of Bambi and sort of the nondescript outside of Thumper, but they were just kind of like mannequins that someone was, you know, playing around with in this movie, for the most part, they have a lot more personality and they've got interpersonal relationships and stuff. Although once they get to act three, they introduce a bunch more characters. They don't give them names or personalities. They just kind of give them fun. Like um, there's the porcupine and his name is just literally porcupine. If you look it up, like they don't even bother giving him a name in the universe, I guess. But for some reason, I remember him being like a favorite at the time I was watching it. But his he has maybe like three lines in the movie. So I've got no idea where that attachment came from. Yeah, well, and you're also you're plenty invested in enough characters by that point. It doesn't matter that much. I, I again, definitely, I would give it the review better in Bambi. Um, now, Lady and Tramp, you're like, oh, I was looking for something like an owl, and it wasn't there. This one certainly has an owl who sings to you. So, uh, did you did you put anything on that? Uh, not not really. Aside from the, for some reason, I kept going to Robin Hood because of the voice, because of the witch and the lady. And then for the owl, um, what was it? Ar Archimedes was the owl in Sword in the Stone. Um, and that one reminded me very much of this one. Because there's also a scene where the owl drops like these pink bloomers on top of Todd, the young owl, to get the old lady to notice him. And that's when she finds the young owls like inside her, her you know, her bloomers, her yeah. pants. And I'm pretty sure I'm, I might be remembering a different movie but i'm pretty sure in sword in the stone there's a scene where archimedes like gets his feathers blown up and he's wearing like these little pink bloomers under his feathers or something um so i just kept seeing these different links to i think my two favorite disney movies of all time like i kept seeing them like recurring themes and voices and animation cells not to mention the design of todd and trixie you know his mate towards the end of the movie look exactly like robin hood and maid marion in the robin hood movie oh yeah and uh, i i just brought up the owl because they reuse disney reuses that design so much like i it did i remember that legitimate legitimately like confusing me as a kid it's like why is the owl in like every movie <laughs> <laughs> but it's like a girl in this one and it's a guy in that one and then it's like yeah, yeah so. tall and singing and another one it's like cranky and not never singing and <laughs> So that that definitely threw me off. But yeah, I mean, that design is very much imprinted into my, you know, like my uh, primordial personality or something. Well, and, and I was surprised at how long it took me to realize that. Uh, and then as soon as I was like, wait a minute, that's the freaking that's Robin Hood and that's made Marion, you know. And uh, but I I, I kind of love seeing the natural progression. And I, I'm 
I'm assuming that Robin Hood came before this movie because Robin Hood was 70s, was it not? Yeah, it was like 71, 72. So th- this was a reuse of those characters in this movie. So that might have also been one of the reasons that I remember this one so much. I think I also might have just had like a sticker book of uh, the fox and the hound that, you know, embedded itself because I just like always had it with me. Yeah, I was going to say, because, um, you know, we didn't get VHS till I was like six or seven. So in the few years before that, I would have had like a storybook of the Fox and the Hound, maybe like a view master of, you know, master view of, of Sword in the Stone. Yeah, and I'm, just... I'm almost positive I had those for Fox and the Hound. <laughs> and yeah, I would just have get those conflated because there's not even the voices. Like you said, why is it, why is it a woman in this one? And because I would have just had the image and, and that would have been like extra confusing. <laughs> So, so I got a couple other interesting notes from the the book outside of that sprawling urban, you know, decay storyline that kind of jumps all the way to the end. Um, and I'll get back to the end because it they have a bunch of beats in the book where it's like, oh, of course, that's never going to make it into a Disney movie. Um, so one of those is that in, instead of, you know, them growing and bonding and becoming friends and having this whole like um, maturing story instead in the book they kind of follow this fox and it they have that same chase scene and the fox causes the hunter's favorite dog to get hit by this train and from this moment on the hunters basically tells like he trains his dog to literally ignore every other animal every other fox in the forest and only hunt this one fox um and at this point too the there's no old lady caring for the fox they've they've kind of turned the humans have turned the fox back over to the wild so the fox is just kind of existing out here so every you know like clockwork this hunter and his dog that survived are just going out and looking for this one fox and they keep getting thwarted every single time and um so one of those times even though the fox gets away they find his litter of brand new baby foxes and wife and they slaughter all of them but the fox gets away this happens again. The fox finds another mate, has another litter, and the hunter and the hound and the hound dog find that litter and massacre them as well. But still, the fox gets away. On the third time, I think it's the very morning after that second sort of fox holocaust, they chase him down again. And this time, the chase lasts so long that the fox collapses and essentially dies. And the the um, bloodhound also almost dies but he collapses on top of the fox and at this point the fox is dead and the guy's you know celebrating the hunter and it almost turns into like his thing you know like the the al bundy like i scored four touchdowns in a game or whatever it was that kind of becomes this guy's thing and he just lives out this like I, i caught that fox that killed my dog um but he rides that out and it slowly becomes sadder and sadder because like there's no other, no other place to hunt. You know, it's like he's in a neighborhood now. Um, and then on top of all of this, he just starts drinking. He has no other pastime because he's peaked. He did the big thing that he's always wanted to do. And his family starts noticing like, hey, you're basically an alcoholic now. Maybe it's time that you reconsider and you go into a retirement home. And he's like pushing back and I don't want to go to retirement home. And eventually they convince him to. And once he um, is convinced to move into a retirement home, he brings his dog out back and covers his eyes and basically puts him out of his misery so that he doesn't bring him with him to the retirement home. So it's like the saddest freaking sequence of events that they skip for obvious reasons in the the Disney cartoon movie with the the cute little fox and hound making friends. Like they couldn't have changed it any more, you know, versus some of the other adaptations they've done. Well, you can't be surprised when a Disney movie disnifies it. I guess <laughs> it's like calling the uh, the kettle black, right? <laughs> but but at a certain point too, it's like, why was this the source material if? <laughs> You know, I don't know. It it was just such a weird adaptation. Like, let's take this very depressing book about how nature is being torn away through urbanization and this hunter that turns into a depressed alcoholic that his family puts into a retirement home. Let's just get rid of all the sad part and just make like the fox and the hound really cool, cute animal friends and no one gets hurt and the train scenes there, but it just break a leg and you know, he's not that bad. He just kind of hypes it up a little bit. Like, I don't know. It's so weird to take all of those key beats and Disney fight every single one of them at a certain point. Why don't you pick a different source material? Well, the 
again, the big argument when making this movie was some of the story editors being like, this movie does not work if Chief lives, but that was overruled. So <laughs> somebody was thinking about, but yeah, it is kind of, you know, you already chose like such a dark source material, I guess. <laughs> it's like you got to roll with it a little bit. Um, were there any other final points you want to throw out on the movie or the book? Uh, I think that's it. I really did try to, to work my best to find some kind of esoteric meanings or deep symbolism. The farthest that I really got was just that Todd translates the Fox, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cool that I never knew before. and doesn't seem like it was ever made obvious, but they obviously did that for that reason. Like there's no other reason you would name this Fox Todd. Sorry, I mean, I, no no offense to any Todds out there. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the thing with this film is it's fascinating because no one's hand was on the tiller enough to really put too much, you know, hidden Th things into the This did not movie. have that, that Kubrick-esque feel to it where, like, every single thing in frame had a reason to be there. Very often it was just like, yeah, someone kind of dropped the ball in this frame, but at the same time, it's still, again, like, part of it being nostalgia, but also compare this to sort of like modern cartoons or even through the eighties, nineties, this still kind of was setting a higher bar than other stuff that was available at the time. Bull Winkle although, being a great example. Uh, although I recently I've, I've been hearing some, some reassessment on Kubrick. Um, I just want to throw out like, that is kind of a stereotype one when you see the guy, I mean, apparently like his home life, but he'd have chaotic dinner parties often, you know, like he was just asking everyone, what can you do? What can you do? He didn't necessarily have something in mind to start with. So there was a lot of serendipity. Peter Sellers basically got to, you know, improv on Dr. Strangelove, Clockwork Orange. I, this blew my mind. The record store in a Clockwork Orange is a location. It is not a set built for that movie. That blew my mind. <laughs> Especially with some of those tight shots that they, they get in there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, once you start looking in so Kubrick of course there is a lot of like well constructed things but there's a lot of serendipity and chaos too which is probably I think that might be the special sauce that make you know like Barry Lyndon well even that one gets weird it's just hard to watch because it's really long and kind of boring but <laughs> well Barry Lyndon's a great example of maybe not every single thing in frame and every you know um movie but that one specifically has got some conspiratorial notes to it oh yes <laughs> you, you use the the same lens that i believe was on like one of the, the original hubble telescopes or some of nasa's it was like this very expensive like as ice uh lens and he shot the whole thing using natural light and candlelight which was basically never done before on this one but also you mentioned uh clockwork orange and i was mentioning adrenochrome before because you brought up them <laughs> clockwork orange actually i think is the very first movie tv visual media that ever brought the word adrenochrome into pop culture and it's just drenchrome um when they're they're going to the bar you know alex and his droogs are getting the the maloko and the milk but one of those things on the background, along with everything else, is Drenchrome, ah, which okay. is stands for Adrenochrome, which he basically got from some Aldous Huxley references. Now, I, re I remember in the book for Clockwork, there's like three kinds of milk. There's the uppers, there's the downers, and there's the psychedelic one. <laughs> well, and, and Drenchrome, I believe, is also mentioned in the book as well. It's classified as one of the psychedelic ones, which is a misnomer from Aldous Huxley's original book, uh, Doors of Perception, where he also also kind of throws it into that same category we i don't want to go on to a deep deep tangent on this one i just thought that was like an interesting oh yeah note. for sure uh, again you could yeah you start telling kubrick it gets dangerous <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. okay uh what's what's going on in your world then uh, uh the biggest one is we're finishing up the chosen one issue two um it's probably going to be ready sometime around December. We're not really sure yet. You know, it's it's a changing world uh, out here. Mm -hmm. But you can follow along at, at Paranoid American on Instagram and on ParanoidAmerican.com. And uh, I mentioned Adrenochrome a few times. I've also been working on a book, like an actual full reference sized book on the topic of Adrenochrome where it came from, all the, the weird places it dovetails into satanic panic and 
uh, all kinds of you know serial killers and cannibalism and all kind of ties together so i'm deciding to put this into a book and not just keep it in my head and and multiple weird sort of like google docs spread across so those are my big projects right now and again my instagram is probably the best place to follow kind of my day-to-day weirdness uh as for me uh i do plenty of podcasting we'll keep the occult disney series going uh head for our patreon at podcastio podcastius where you'll find that and even if you're not paying you'll find links to other podcasts like matt and luke's sci-fi sanctuary where we talk about sci-fi movies including a few of those kubrick ones um time enough podcast is a breakdown of the twilight zone episode by episode and you can get in some video games that i'm not necessarily on with luke loves pokemon you can guess what that's about monster mash about monster hunter and the game game show which i have um described as as four british guys screaming insults at each other which can be quite fun <laughs> okay i'm we gonna should go try with... that for the next one <laughs> was that we should try that for the next one. Just scream British insults at each other. Oh, well, you can just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be fun. I, I can't do it, though, because I podcast with a regular British guy. He'll call me out for lame accents. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's the uh, the next movie to look forward to? Oh, for us, uh, Sleeping Beauty is up next. Okay. Yeah, that, that's plenty for one episode, for sure. That we'll have plenty of plunge into. So, okay, I'm going to go on the hunt for guitars today, but that's cool. As in, I'm going to go play a bunch of them. I already bought enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Sweet. Great.